Hey, everybody. It's just me in an unstructured chat. So if anyone has, I don't think we have like a formal Q&A, but if anyone has questions, you can just shout them at us, I guess. But uh, yeah, I want to, I've followed your work for a long time. It's obviously extremely influential. And I think, especially when all of this was getting started, the psychedelic renaissance, a lot of people had a hope that not only do psychedelics make people better, but that it could be demonstrated that they have some kind of positive impact on people. And you were, I think, one of the first people to look at psychedelics and ecological awareness, right? Yeah. Yes, we were. Could be with you all. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, so we, we've done a study looking at nature connectedness. Um, so there's, uh, there are formal measures of how much you value your environment, the environment, how much you feel connected to nature, and we saw we saw increases in that. So it sort of speaks to part of maybe the, the hippification process with psychedelics. So it's nice to test that and, and demonstrate it. And what did you find? Yeah, uh, we saw uh, we saw increases in nature. Uh, connectedness, so people were reporting feeling more connected to to the um, to nature, um, but it was a, a more general um, sense of connectedness that we were seeing increase. So people were also reporting feeling more connected to themselves, deeper aspects of themselves, their emotions, their bodies, other people, and then uh, their surroundings more generally. But you know more specifically uh, the natural surroundings. And you were measuring this with surveys, right? Yeah, we, we used a couple of different methods. We Actually, just tell me about the whole process of this. Like, you would give people psilocybin, and then yeah. tell me how you'd go about studying something like that. Yeah, so we, we do both controlled studies, so we administer uh, the psychedelics, and much of our work has been psilocybin, um, and so it might be a depression trial. We've done a couple of depression trials with psilocybin therapy. Um, and we measure, it's you know, a simple process of measuring nature connectedness at baseline before any drug, and then measuring at some key endpoint, just some specific time after giving the drug. So we do that in our controlled studies, and we also use a more, um, maybe more novel approach compared to what others have done, um, using online surveys, but not just doing them in retrospect, but using them, them more as a kind of tracker across time. So we use those surveys prospectively. We ask people to sign up if they intend to take a psychedelic, and then we can collect data pre-use of the psychedelic and then look at different time points in relation to the psychedelic experience and track them over time as well. That's that's something we've done, and in both those different varieties, we've seen a number of different psychological changes and an increased appreciation for, for nature is something that we've seen across studies. Whenever Rick Doblin talks about psychedelic research, he always makes a point of saying that he's not a scientist, he's a political scientist, that he has a, a very specific motivation in the work that he's doing, which is to do research that helps raise awareness of the benefits of psychedelics. Do you see yourself that way? Was that something that you were thinking about the political implications of ecological awareness and how that will alter the way people perceive psychedelics? Yeah, I don't really. Um, I see myself more as a pure scientist. And well, you know, I'll say to colleagues, I'd rather not get pulled into the politics. They'll say it's well, it's inevitable, and you know, you can't do science without being politically slanted in some way. And uh, I think they they have a point. It's just I don't want to get sucked into any particular political position that might bias the science I do. So. Well, it might be a bit idealist, but I, I describe myself more as an observer or an inquirer. And in that way, I, I don't get involved in uh, lobbying or you know, positions of policy. Um, at least I don't get directly involved. 
Yeah, but I would say that when we measured uh, nature relatedness, we were also measuring political perspective. So this is another aspect of it, to come in and measure the different dimensions of political perspective. So the two classic dimensions are uh, liberalism to conservatism, and then authoritarianism to anti-authoritarianism or libertarianism. And um, so we saw these interesting changes towards, at least in the first study, it was towards liberalism, away from conservatism, post-psychedelic use. And, uh, and the more reliable finding that has somewhat held up across studies is an increase in libertarianism or anti-authoritarianism. But you know, to present results like that and not get drawn into sort of lobbying or I don't know, holding up results like that as something good <laughs> and, and promoting it felt quite important. Now, now others might think differently, but uh, I think for credibility, if we can just sample, inquire, and then report with being truer to the scientific process. Right. I mean, I see this even in my own thinking about the subject. I was, I was reading an interview that I did maybe five years ago, and I was surprised by my own eagerness to engage in these sorts of politics of respectability issues with psychedelics. Like, I wanted to say that psychedelics are good. I wanted to say, yeah, I think they do make you more ecologically conscious, or I think they, they do have a positive impact. And I've sort of revised my position on that. Not that I think that those things aren't true, but I've started to, on one point, find them less relevant, and on another point, recognize how they can very easily backfire in unintended, in unintended ways. Like one example would be, you know, one of the early findings to come out of Johns Hopkins was the increase in trade openness. And for those that don't know, there's a five-factor model that's used in psychology where you have uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And Personality is considered solidified in adulthood, so to find a change in personality in and of itself in any direction was considered somewhat unusual. And then this increase in openness was especially exciting because that sounds like a good thing. Psychedelics are changing personality and they're changing it in a way that sounds desirable. So everyone is very excited by this finding, which I think is actually hasn't really been reproduced in subsequent studies. It mixed. It's been mixed. Okay. So, but I, and then I was I was doing an interview with uh, Doctor Drew, and he was saying, you know, well, I don't I don't want to change my personality. This is a reason not to use psychedelics. I heard they change your personality. That's the last thing I want. And I was thinking, oh, well, that backfired. I guess. I mean, not that I also don't really think it would change his personality all that much. I don't think that that's necessarily a legitimate fear. And I've seen the same sort of unintended backfiring happen with some of the work on ecological consciousness where or anti-authoritarian thinking or then that invites people to say oh, oh yeah well i actually think they make you more authoritarian or more susceptible to authoritarian conditioning i don't know if you saw this uh this paper i got in horrible trouble for making fun of it but uh but <laughs> I'll just double down now. <laughs> but uh, the, the paper made the claim, uh, I imagine a good number of you are familiar with the Milgram experiments, but if you're not, you know, this is a kind of seminal work on authoritarian control where if somebody in a lab code tells you to electrocute somebody, the people are likely to do it because an authority figure told them to do it. And this is kind of considered to have some explanatory value in terms of uh, everything from genocide to authoritarianism. So there have been an enormous number of uh, sort of neo-Milgram experiments. So there was one that was done in Singapore where they found that people who were told to feel grateful were more likely to place worms in a mock coffee grinder. And not a real one, a mock coffee grinder. And, uh, and some people saw this, and they wrote a paper saying, well, psychedelics cause gratitude, and gratitude causes increased susceptibility to authoritarian control via the coffee grinder experiment. Therefore, 
Yeah. Psychedelics increase vulnerability to authoritarian control. So this is some uh, really wacky syllogism here. But people took this stuff seriously. Like people were, I, I am making fun of it, but uh, people actually took it seriously. And then I started thinking, okay, well this is obviously ridiculous, but is this the inevitable consequence of making the opposite claim? Of saying that they make you less susceptible to authoritarian control? Does this, is this, getting caught up in these debates about what psychedelics do to you? Do they make you more or less ecologically conscious, more or less authoritarian? Does this invite a distracting conversation when none of these things even matter? Oh, I think it matters. <laughs> yeah. I think it matters a great deal, especially if psychedelic use is increasing and, and access could open up. If, if psychedelics could change personality and with personality, you know, one reason why we looked at political perspective was because of the openness change. And uh, um, liberalism, I think it goes this way, liberalism tends to move with openness, so there's a correlation in that direction. Uh, away from conservatism, which is sort of inverse openness. <laughs> um, so that was the kind of motivation to look there, was knowing that there was that correlation. And of course, you know, uh, things happened in the 60s, <laughs> and uh, psychedelics were associated with countercultural thinking, and um, of course, um, and you know, Many have argued that that was the demise of, you know, the scientific and medical work with with psychedelics was that they became politicized and the powers that be, you know, the man thought that this was a was a threat to the system, and if it was, if psychedelics do change people and change people with even though there's always some variation uh, with a particular direction, then people are going to care about that, you know? Uh, yeah. And granted it's more complex and that there have been papers on, um, on the, the outliers. I, I think, I see it more that way. You're always going to see the, the variation of where do you place the emphasis. I just wonder whether there was a, <laughs> a particular agenda behind some of those papers where it was like, oh no, don't mention that. <laughs> don't shine a spotlight on the potential for psychedelics to drive some kind of open-minded thinking, which is away from, say, authoritarianism. Right. And yeah, I should revise what I said. I agree that it matters. It does matter. I guess my concern is more that these things are extremely difficult to measure and the public has a way of running with any kind of scientific conclusion. I've, I'm often amazed by how the smallest scientific study can fundamentally change the way people think about things. And, and the analogy that I always use for psychedelics is music, where I guarantee that with enough resources, you could conduct a scientific study and you could demonstrate that a certain type of music or music listened to under some circumstances increases ecological consciousness or decreases ecological consciousness or increases susceptibility to authoritarian control or decreases it. But if that study came out, I assume most of the people here wouldn't fundamentally change the way they think about music because it doesn't matter whether or not music makes you more or less ecologically conscious, it's not really the reason that you're listening to it to begin with. And so it's not so much that I think it doesn't matter, it does, I think it, the concern is that these studies will dramatically alter the way that people talk about these things in a way that may not address the core reasons for using them in the first place. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the case with music, it's especially difficult to know cause and effect there, you know, if you start listening to some particular genre of music because you've changed, <laughs> maybe through something else like a psychedelic experience, or um, is, the, uh, is the music itself being causal of some change, maybe in the direction of psychedelics, just as examples. But um, yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to tease, it is hard to tease these things apart. I had another thought and then I lost it, so I was about to cue, cue me with something. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I mean, I think it's of course admirable that you don't engage with a lot of the 
controversial elements of all of this. It's good to have people that uh, like stay out of these wars surrounding psychedelics. But also, you and your work were absolutely central to Michael Pollan and how to change your mind and have been core to the psychedelic renaissance. So you, even if you yourself don't consider the work politically motivated, your work has been used by other people in informing this, this major initiative to increase public understanding of psychedelics. How did that feel for you, knowing that the work that you were doing was being used by Michael Pollan to introduce psychedelics to a mainstream audience? Yeah, it mixed feelings. You know, it was great for, for kind of, uh, it was a kind of springboard for the area in general. People talk about the Michael Pollan effect. Personally, it probably brought me to the Bay Area. Um, I'm at UCSF now, I was working in London. Um, I think Michael has been helpful for my career, even founding the centre in London and, uh, and, you know, raising money for the research. It's helped. That's just the, the truth, the reality. But what, what's always surprised me is how literally people take the findings and they also misunderstand the scientific process. Um, and I kind of understand why they might, because it's a bit of a slow, um, it's a slow kind of realization. Because science is iterative, you know, it learns by making mistakes. And uh, when you're doing, you know, novel research, some of it first time ever, like looking in the brain for the first time, uh, with modern techniques to look at brain activity under psychedelics, you're really feeling your way in the dark, like the parameters aren't set at all, and you're finding your way, oh, here's, here's the default mode network, oh, this is changing, oh, that's a hot topic right now, and there's some converging evidence to link it to the sense of self, to the ego, you know, maybe it's breakdown under psychedelics relates to ego dissolution, we can find one or two correlations here, all of a sudden it's like center stage in, in my conception on the neuroscience is, is, is the emphasis that, you know, uh, honestly I have been placing on an action on this particular system in the brain under psychedelics, but uh, the science moves on, it self-corrects, we realize that it's, it's not just about the default mode network, it's one network of several that change under psychedelics. And so that's a thing, you know, people can sort of find a book that's sort of, you know, frozen in time almost, whereas the science is moving on the time and self-correcting. And so, you know, I remember once actually recently, there's a, another technology that's developed that's quite exciting of ultrasound, uh, focused ultrasound stimulation. So this is using ultrasound to stimulate deep nuclei in the brain. And a particular innovative team, um, at the time out of Arizona, were focusing intentionally, based on our psychedelic brain imaging work, a nuclei, a certain region of the brain in the default mode network, to try and encourage ego dissolution in meditators. I'm oversimplifying here, but that was part of the exploration. That's why, at least this is what uh, one of the lead researchers told me, they were inspired by that work to stimulate there. And that was kind of scary, you know. The, 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 the impact of um, certain narratives, but also certain findings on both scientists and the public is something that has been a bit of a wake-up call, personally. Oh yeah, it's been huge. I mean, I remember speaking at a Kennedy conference, and there was a, a Kennedy physician who just kept talking about uh, destroying the demon and I was like, the demon? He's like, the DMN, the default node of the network. That's what we're over. Uh, you have to destroy the demon. That's what these drugs do. And I thought, wow, this is really uh, <laughs> this is amazing how people have integrated this entirely into their conception of the psychedelic experience. Uh, but it also speaks to a need for these explanatory frameworks. I think that uh, you know, people will often ask me, like, well, how, how do psychedelics do it? How do they... Uh, how, how are they causing you to trip? And you know, you say, oh, well, you know, they, they bind as agonists to the 5-HT1A receptor. And it's like, okay, that doesn't seem to have a lot of explanatory value in terms of the qualitative effects. And you can keep going down that road with second messengers and increased activity in this or that part of the brain. But there's often, I feel, a 
disconnect between molecular neuropharmacology and experience. And many of the researchers that I've admired most have been people who almost gave up on the disconnect. Someone like Alexander Scholl, you know, I really admire, was someone who I think very wisely abandoned pharmacology entirely in his work. He did almost no pharmacology at all. And that was a really smart move on his part because if he used his best years doing pharmacology work instead of taking drugs and making drugs and writing reports with his wife and his friends on what those drugs did, all this work would be obsolete by now. We wouldn't even be talking about Alexander Shulkin. He'd be another one of these people who did some rat fundus experiment that someone wouldn't even feel comfortable citing in a scientific paper anymore. But because he focused on qualitative effects and personal experience, his work is truly immortal and timeless. And do you ever fear that a, a model is, I mean, you mentioned that it's been revised. I mean, what are your concerns about the neuroimaging work you do and what it does and does not capture? Yeah, well, well it's, it's a start. And perhaps it, I think sometimes people expect too much of it too soon, I would say, in the defense of human brain imaging. I think it gets closer to a level of translational bridging to subjective experience that is more intellectually satisfying and appealing, intuitively appealing than, than at, at certain lower levels. And everything bridges between levels, whether it's the molecule binding to a certain receptor that's on certain cells that have certain properties and then the signaling at that receptor changes the cell functioning in a particular way that then relates to population level activity of you know, groups of thousands of cells and then thousands of those cells relate to others in a circuit and then that circuit can be looked at as a dynamic network in the living human brain and, and about at that point we start to have some interesting mappings so we can we can look and it is it is mostly correlative work so we are in this game of looking at the neural correlates of certain experiences but i don't give up <laughs> i see it more as that's the quest that's the challenge and i'd also say we can be optimistic about it this is where i would differ from some others in the field that sometimes I hear them and I think, well, that's, that's nice and humble and I respect that, you know, we know nothing about the brain. And sometimes I just wonder whether it's, we could do a bit better at that. And actually we do know some things and there are some converging evidences and we can improve our techniques. And it's, my approach is, I would describe as more of a positivist kind of approach. And I'm also mindful that the psychedelic experiences are so strange and so mysterious on that poetic level that we could imagine that they're somehow beyond the brain. And of course, many people do. And I say, I caught myself there because I was very brain-centric, beyond the body, beyond this living you know, uh, system, complex system that we are, where it's not just the brain, what's going on in the periphery matters as well. Um, but I don't want to leave it to, you know, projecting in sort of, ideas that, that don't have a very good evidence base it, when we give up, you know? And, and uh, so much is increasingly being discovered about the brain that I actually think we know more than we realize, and in time there will be something of a demystification process. Um, I don't think it will kill the mystery in the poetic sense. We'll still be in awe that these biological processes can give rise to such complex phenomenology. Um, but I, I don't think you'll be able to get away with, you know, project, projecting into that space ideas of some kind of, you know, metaphysical transcendentalism or something beyond the brain that, that really doesn't have any firm grounding in the you know, understanding of uh, some scientific principles. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's it's good. It's it's a bit of a cop out to always say we don't know anything about the brain, we don't know anything about consciousness. I, I agree, it's it's worth trying. <laughs> it's definitely worth trying. You know, the classic one in the context of religion. I'm really catching myself again because I don't want to 
upset anyone, but is, is the whole God in the gaps kind of thing, you know, where into the mystery we project some all-knowing, all-powerful, um, you know, um, uh, um, mover and shaker behind the scenes that created it all and isn't had a you know, clean narrative, and of course there are a bunch of different narratives, but, um, but people historically uh, have gone to those narratives and have gathered around those narratives and they've filled those mysterious gaps with, with these narratives. And, and I'm just saying in the psychedelic space, uh, and, and the parallels are quite strong because of course mystical religious experience, mystical experience, spiritual experiences are again so profound, so transformative and so mysterious in that poetic sense that we we then, you know, can self-organize these narratives around that. It's probably, you know, many people have argued that that was the birth of, of organized religion. And it's just a, a similar thing could happen with psychedelics where we create cohesive narratives around this mysterious experience that perhaps, you know, that, uh, that could be problematic, you know, in my view. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're saddled to the wild. Sorry? The psychedelics are being saddled with a lot, with uh, using Where these tools to understand that? consciousness, to revitalize and renew religion, to reform drug policy and capitalism. I'm seeing a lot of uh, weight being put on the psychedelics. Right. And maybe it's, in some of these neuroscientific domains, maybe it's valid. Yeah, maybe. And, and I guess that's why I, I have wanted not to get pulled into the politics of psychedelics is that you will see people canalize, you know, get stuck in certain positions on them that maybe these are tools to ch really challenge the, the current system as part of a like anti-capitalist agenda or there's others who just want to cash in and, you know, can I develop my new startup and make big bucks off this thing? And so um, you can see how it, it can't avoid, because they're so powerful and influential, they can't avoid taking people in these different directions. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I mean, that promotion of openness, of plasticity, the sensitivity to surroundings, to context also, there is something to be said for, for making people hypersensitive are they more suggestible? Uh, can they be shaped more by their surroundings, people around them, whatever narratives are coming in, you know, QAnon shaman, <laughs> taking psychedelics and then getting into alt-right politics and canalizing in that particular direction. I, I can see how that kind of thing can happen. And I, I suppose it's just a little bit of a warning, maybe, or a cautionary note that um, of, of, of holding the experience lightly and not, not uh, you know, keeping an inquiring mind and not uh, feeling the need to go hard into some particular kind of narrative. Yeah. Yeah. One question I think about a lot with psychedelics is, you know, I would like to think that if I didn't know what benzodiazepines were and didn't know anything about benzodiazepines, but someone showed me what is known about benzodiazepines in terms of their molecular pharmacology. I could maybe figure out what a benzodiazepine does. I might say, oh, okay, all right, well, it's doing this, and it's decreasing fire in here, and this might act like, it might cause amnesia, and it might make you tired, and it might uh, have a sort of sedative, almost anesthetic effect, and at high doses, it might suppress breathing, and it might make you totally unconscious. But with psychedelics, I often feel unsatisfied by the explanations, often because the explanations that are offered are not exclusively things that psychedelics do. So the, the very fashionable thing has been synaptogenesis, spinogenesis, dendritic remodeling, that sort of thing. And you hear a lot of discussion about psychedelics inducing neurogenesis. But for anyone that's followed pharmacology literature for the last 20, 30 years, you also see people talking about spinogenesis in the domain of drugs like cocaine. But in that instance, it's being talked about as something that may reinforce the addictiveness of the drug. So you have two different drugs, one that is being viewed as a bad thing, so you use dendritic remodeling as an 
evidence for its badness and another drug that is being used as a good thing and you use alterations in the dendritic head or spinogenesis as some evidence that they're good. The same thing is true of neurogenesis, right? We've, we've had drugs that very potently induced neurogenesis like NSI-189 that failed miserably in clinical trials as an antidepressant. So the dendritic remodeling, as far as I can tell, is not necessarily unique to psychedelics, uh, nor does it have uh, explanatory value in terms of why they may do what they do. The activity of serotonin receptors is not entirely unique either. And this sometimes makes me wonder, if I didn't know that psychedelics were psychedelic, is there anything that would show me that? Yeah, I mean, these are uh, uh, great points. Um, you know, a colleague of mine said to me once, um, the brain, the brain is only as interesting as the mind. You know? And uh, if we're here today because of Bicycle Day, and we're here today because of psychedelics, maybe, uh, then we probably had uh, you know, very profound uh, experiences with these compounds, those altered states of consciousness that have, that have just, we found so deeply fascinating that we can't let it go. You know? So it started with the experience. The experience was bottom line. We don't really get excited about psychedelics because we've seen some novel action in the brain. I would say, however, that I wouldn't be surprised if that comes. Once we have a decent enough handle on the, um, perhaps particularly on the, um, the global brain dynamics, um, and then when we see things through the lens of what's called cognitive neuroscience, or I guess more specifically human brain imaging, we might see things, qualities of change that are just really unusual. And people might start saying to each other, or other cognitive neuroscientists, uh, you don't see that. You don't see that kind of thing ordinarily. And all of a sudden we're looking at a novel brain change and saying, wow. At the moment, we're just having the experiences, no, just, we're having the experiences, and we're saying, wow, and, and people have, uh, you know, time immemorial when they've had psychedelic experiences. But it does start, it does start with the mind. I would say some of the things around, well, I have a little bugbear about terminology, and um, one of them is psychoplastogens, a term that's been introduced about these compounds from um, behavioral neuroscience, which more specifically and accurately is, is rodent neuroscience, where the, um, the measure has been changes in properties of the neurons, and, and a bit more specifically, the, generally speaking, the, the bits for picking up signal, whether it's the dendrites or the spines of neurons. Um, and yet the term that's been applied is psychoplastogen, psycho. You know, of the psyche, of the soul, and then applying that to these, you know, receiving components of neurons. That translational bridge, okay, that, that's sloppy, in my view. <laughs> they should have been called, you know, dendritoplastogens, if you're looking at aspects of behavior, and then translating to the human animal. Um, in rodents, it's often head twitch, used as the marker, and then they'll describe these compounds as non-hallucinogenic um, psychedelics, for example. Whereas really they're non-twitchogenic, um, non-twitchogenic, and compounds that are often serotonin to a receptor agonists. That in most cases those compounds in humans have psychedelic properties, revealing the psyche, revealing the soul. So I, I see a lot of this kind of. There's some fantastic work at that low level, but the extrapolations up to humans and the terms used, I find a bit sloppy at times. Yeah, I'm glad he went there. I'm glad he went there. Okay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, back to what you were saying earlier. So if I if I make a new drug and I'm curious if it's a psychedelic and I don't have the opportunity to give it to a human being, the steps are you do in vitro binding and you look at its binding to 2A, and you look at the functional activity, and then you give it to a rodent, and if the rodent twitches its head, and it's a 5-HT2A agonist, then you think, all right, 
chances are that this is probably a psychedelic in humans. I mean, there are other complicated factors like 5-HG1A can dampen the head twitch response and on and on and on. There's, it's not quite that simple, but basically this has a, a decent bit of predictive value. Do you think there's anything with analogous predictive value in neuroimaging? Yes. <laughs> so one of them is uh, uh, this measure of the complexity of population level activity that we can pick up with um, techniques like electroencephalography, which is actually quite an old technique. It goes back, I think, maybe to the 20s, uh, maybe earlier. But uh, essentially, just through um, putting um, uh, electrodes on the scalp, you can pick up oscillating electrical fields through the skull uh, that have their origin in, in uh, neural populations. Um, and uh, you can track that activity across time. It has a certain rhythmicity in the human brain and in the awake adult human brain. There are certain signature qualities to that activity. There's a lot of rhythmicity in a certain frequency called the alpha frequency, for example. You close your eyes, it's even stronger, but one of the signatures of that, of that, um, that rhythm is that it's especially, it's especially pronounced in the human animal and in the adult human animal when awake. Anyway, psychedelics really collapse the alpha rhythm, uh, in a sense, signature of human waking consciousness is collapsed, but we can also look at the complexity of the ongoing signal, or its entropy, its informational entropy, how much potential information is held in this signal, how varied is it, how random is it across time. And what we've seen is that we can pick up that, um, that increase in signal complexity or entropy as soon as the drug effect comes on, it tracks the intensity of the drug experience in humans and our other animals, presumably. Um, and, uh, and not just that, but it, it relates to the intensity of the experience, as I just said, and predicts things further on in time. So we found recently that it, it predicts scores on psychological insights that are given the next day. And it's also predicting now change in, changes in mental health outcomes one month later. So the signal that we can pick up and is a peak effect at peak subjective effects is also being not just correlating with subjective experience but predicting things further out. And can this differentiate between different drugs that are referred to as psychedelic? Because sometimes <clears throat> the word psychedelic is used very specifically to refer to classical 5-HG2A agonists. Sometimes it's used more broadly to describe NMDA antagonist associatives and all sorts of things, GABA A agonists, cannabinoids, anticholinergics. Do you think you can differentiate between these different types of visionary or psychedelic substances? Yeah, that's a great question because we don't know yet. What, what we have seen is that ketamine will increase the signal complexity. If so if you take this increase in signal complexity or entropy as a marker of psychedelic action, then according to that marker, ketamine would be a psychedelic. And I'm I'm not sure that I would be a lumper in this case. You know, you can either be a lumper, simplify things, or a splitter, pass things, and, and be a bit more precise. And, you know, I think if, if you look at the subjective experience, you can pass ketamine from the classic psychedelics, like you can pass the classic psychedelics from MDMA. Um, we don't know that MDMA increases signal complexity. A great test would be to look at stimulants like amphetamines and today increase signal complexity or entropy. I'm, I'm struggling to find uh, good prior work on that, but often encouraging others to do it. Um, you know, ideas are, are cheap and data's expensive, so I, I call these things pub conversations. I'd rather just say, you know, come on, everyone, let's test that, rather than, you know, being protective of ideas. So, um, we shall see whether there is specificity to the entropic brain effect um, to classic psychedelics versus ketamine. Um, ketamine is a therapeutic, unless it's twinned with psychotherapy, where you've got a different causal agent than just the drug. Psychotherapy is a causal agent. Um, and so, but if you give just the drug, you know, you just have ketamine infusion, then the uh, therapeutic effects are typically short-lived. 
And so now there's this interesting question, well, what's a marker of that? And maybe with a classic psychedelic like psilocybin or LSD or DMT and ayahuasca, if the therapeutic window is longer, if you're getting more enduring effects, then what's a marker of that? And these are some of the things that aren't well enough um, known at the moment. We've got other markers in the fMRI. We look at the, um, the degree to which brain systems or networks are segregated from each other, how easily they naturally pass from each other. And we see that that passing collapses under drug. They become more similar to each other. People may be familiar with those two circles. You've seen them in the centerfold of Michael Pollard's book, showing the increase in communication across the brain under psychedelics, colorful circles. I think they're in color in most of uh, the editions of Michael's book. Um, but anyway, that's the, the breakdown of the segregation between systems. That's something that we see very clearly, very reliably under psychedelic, but also quite recently we've seen it after psychedelic therapy and depression, and the magnitude of that effect correlated with decreases in symptom severity. So what we have at, at the moment are these candidate markers. And like I said, you know, learning from maybe mistakes with the default mode network, we put them out there as, as candidate markers. We don't say this is this is the absolute truth, you know, everyone get behind this and believe it. We say, maybe, maybe this is a thing. And, and you all, you know, if you want to, might, you know, the community, the scientific community might want to test these markers because maybe they'll end up being um, sensitive and specific and, and we'll really learn something about the action of, of the treatment. Right. And in terms of chemistry and pharmacology, it's very easy to differentiate these different types of substances that are sometimes called psychedelic provisionary. It sounds like in terms of the neuroimaging, it's a little bit less clear, but maybe. But I'm wondering, because I know that you're also very interested in psychology and psychoanalysis, and this is something I don't have any answer to, why is it, do you think, that people even want to use this term for these, these substances? What does it mean for something to be psychedelic? I think they want to use it because we often intuit when something resonates or not. Or, or say it even more frankly, when something is true or not. And I think we intuit that these compounds are psyche-revealing, that they reveal aspects of our minds and maybe the mind, you know? The human mind, where human in an extended sense, obviously we have an evolutionary history, but we can see deeply into the mind. And so there's something about that term psychedelic, revealing the psyche, making the psyche manifest. And I say psyche intentionally because it does have a more poetic feel than just mind. Uh, and and I, I perhaps stop on soul. So psyche is, is my go-to. Uh, I think we believe that that's true. And actually, I think we could have better measures for speaking to that property, like directly asking people as we do for other dimensions of the experience, like the changes in, you know, visual perception, um, we should ask people directly, or we could ask people directly to rate those psyche-revealing properties. And, and then in that way, perhaps, you know, work towards a more precise passing between the classic psychedelics, which I truly believe are psychedelic, and MDMA that is partially psychedelic, psychedelic like it can reveal aspects of the psyche it opens people up emotionally so let's emotions flow more freely and defenses do come down it's it's partially psychedelic and then ketamine yeah used in a particular way you might be able to harness some sort of psychedelic like properties but you know more i i think the reason why psychedelics have captured people's imagination to the extent that they have is actually because of the classics. I think if it, if it wasn't for LSD in particular, yeah, these compounds would have had a big cultural impact, MDMA in particular, um, but I don't think they would have had quite the impact that they have, have had if it wasn't for, for the classic psychedelics, I guess. Yeah, I still have difficulty with the term. I understand what you're saying, but every time I think about the concept of mind manifesting, 
I wonder, is my mind not manifesting now? Does caffeine not manifest your mind? Does nicotine not manifest your mind? What, yeah. that isn't really... I would say a superficial aspect of the, mind, the analytical mind. I mean, that's the thing that really uh, stuns you with the classic psychedelics. You know, when, you, when you have people really open up about things that have happened in their lives that have been so influential, traumatic experiences, or you know, insights about things that have happened in their childhood or their childhood more generally, um, and then, you know, in psychedelic therapy work in particular, it's more reliable that we see these very strong cathartic uh, responses, you know, proportionally, a good proportion of people in tears during the experience. You don't get that with, with a cup of coffee, generally. Yeah, that's true. Excuse me. Uh, I, at this time, just out of respect for your time, I wonder if we could have a few minutes of question and answer at this time for the audience. Yeah. Awesome. Let's open it up to the room. You talked about earlier about the disconnect between describing the experience at the 5-2-A and MA, we got it all the names of the reception. Um, and then the, the narrative form providing a lot of value. Uh, I have found uh, really interesting abstractable patterns if you pay attention to the experience closer to the narrative and understand that a lot of the details about the environment, including especially related to temperature and where it is concentrated on the body. You tend to think of the chest or the heart as a feeling area in the body because something's happening there. And I'm curious, uh, if, if you just move that, that area of focus where you're trying to abstract valuable patterns about what produces a certain experience closer in terms of monitoring these kinds of things, uh, what are your thoughts on finding more value there? We, we could definitely, I don't know if this will answer your question, but we could definitely do a better job of uh, looking beyond just the brain when, when we're asking the question, how are these compounds working? Just as we could do a better job with um, uh, measuring the phenomenology, I think one of the reasons why we haven't done a good enough job of passing between the compounds in terms of a modality like brain imaging is because we do these mappings between experience and brain activity, but we, we've actually overlooked the measures of subjective experience somewhat. We've sort of you know, contented ourselves with some relatively old scales that when they were developed, weren't developed specifically for psychedelics. Uh, a lot of cannabis research actually um, contributed to the development of this Dietrich, uh, originally a five-dimension scale. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent a little bit, but I just think we could do a better job all round. <laughs> and I say that because, you know, I'm in this game and I'm just realizing where there's room for improvement. Um, but uh, I wanted to mention peripheral, measuring peripheral physiology uh, might be relevant to the point you were making where we can, we can have sensors to look at electrodermal response and uh, heart, uh, heart activity, cardiac activity and breathing. Uh, I'm probably missing some things, my colleagues will tell me later, but you know, more sensors around the body um, to see how these rhythms couple up. And um, you know, also taking peripheral uh, fluids, you know, blood and and so on to see how systems outside the brain, which of course are coupled to this central, you know, uh, central information processor, how what's going on there is still in your body, it still affects your subjective experience, of course. So, um, yeah, there's room for improvement. I probably haven't answered your question very well. It's hard to hear as well, to be honest. But, uh, that's my excuse. Maybe later on you can grab me. Uh, hi. Um, familiar with both of your work and a uh, big fan. 
Um, my question is in regards to, um, so I currently am employed as a clinical social worker um, with UCSF. Uh, based in the Tenderloin, and every day I'm confronted with real, significant human suffering um, and how um, the difference in um, brain physiology perpetuates this continued uh, suffering. And my question to you is, at what point do you think um, there will be advances um, that will help reduce suffering for some of our most um, afflicted uh, people. Is it all right? Well, I, I will say, you know, when I arrived to um, uh, there's, there's um, people on the streets in London, but it's, it's nothing like what I encountered when I came here. And I was kind of scared to see it, but also, and so, in a sense, primed to, but then still the reality of seeing it was just so shocking. And, and what, what I did was that I, I um, managed to connect with, um, with uh, somebody in the Tenderloin, another social worker, and, and she took me on a tour around the Tenderloin. I think it was the day after Halloween, and, and I think there's some, something happens there, maybe there's some benefits that, you know, so there's some money, and a little bit of money in people's hands, and there was a lot of trading going on, a lot of, a lot of people buying, buying hard drugs. It was, yeah, it was quite an eye opener. You know, when, when I arrived with all this idealism, I was like, I'd love to do something in, in, the, in that population. Um, but then you realize that there's some naivety in that idealism, unfortunately, and then it's like, well, over time, it's, it's morphed into collaborating with a colleague at, at UCSF, Josh Woolley, who runs a lab um, here, uh, who had won a, a bit of pilot money to do a study in meth uh, use disorder. And there you've got a specific uh, disorder, uh, a specific problem you know, that you could treat. I guess there are these issues around, yeah, being a bit more precise of what we could contribute there. But I remember one thing that stuck in my mind as I said to this, this lady, very generous to give me her time and take me around, I, I said, uh, what's the worst drug on the streets? <laughs> you know? And I thought she'd say fentanyl, and she said meth. She, I just, I, the way it uh, takes people over, and then they don't come back. You know? And uh, that, was, that surprised me. So I don't know, but maybe maybe addiction disorders, of course, the psychosis that's so prevalent on the street, some of it induced by the the drugs themselves, and maybe meth specifically, is an issue there. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, things are so desperate. You know, um, current treatments for meth use disorder are so poor that they're, they're not they're no better than, to my knowledge. It seemed no better than spontaneous remission rates over, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the long term, which are 20 percent. The current treatment's no better than doing nothing. I mean, that that, that that would probably upset a few people who are trying things in that population, but it's an incredibly stark problem. So to try and do something in that space would be so satisfying, and it would be a start. I think it's also worth adding that the anti-addictive effects of psychedelics are relatively well established in a number of experiments at this point. LSD for alcoholism, psilocybin for smoking cessation, ibogaine for opioid use disorder, and on and on and on. And it works for a lot of people, but if people's basic needs are not being met, if they don't have housing, if they don't have food, if they don't have community support and mental health treatment, the most powerful anti-addictive intervention in the world won't do much good if they go back right to where they came that put them in the position of abusing drugs in the first place. And so I think it can be a little bit naive to look at psychedelics as a magic bullet that will instantaneously cure these diseases that have a much broader social cause. And I don't think psychedelics in isolation 
we'll be able to treat a lot of these people. It, it requires uh, many different factors to address all the different needs that they might have. But as part of a broader treatment plan, I think that they have the potential to help a lot of people. Hi, thank you for being here and having such a wonderful discussion. Um, I had a question about uh, psychedelic synergies of multiple compounds. Um, in my own experience, and I think many people would agree um, with this, uh, is that combinations of uh, serotonergic psychedelics or even non-serotonergic psychedelics can be more effective, more therapeutic, have lower risk profiles. Um, you know, um, Shulkin, for instance, briefly mentioned uh, combining MDMA and 2CB as being like a very effective way of enhancing the MDMA experience. Um, and, uh, you know, also ketamine in, in combination with serotonergic psychedelics, in my own experience, has been very effective. Um, so, I was, but um, surprisingly, in the literature I've seen, it seems like studying these synergies and their therapeutic effects is relatively uh, understudied. And I was wondering uh, what the uh, challenges in in uh, studying synergies are, um, and and why it hasn't been explored so much. Well, one one reason that I've encountered is that uh, the companies who are on a development track uh, do want to de-risk and uh, a study that would combine now their very precious compound with another that, where there could be adverse events isn't consistent with a, a de-risking strategy. So it, it, it really would fall into the ballpark of inquirers like me uh, but then you still need to get compound to do such explorative science. And it, it, it's a little tricky, but that kind of, you know, playing in the sand kind of ex explorative work is so important. Just as the, the development work is as well, I mean, in terms of bringing psychedelics to, you know, major breaking through in terms of major access, um, at least through the medical system, you know, you require the development track and a kind of laser focus to do that. Like some maps have been so good to delivering on, on a model like that. Very, very focused, you know, one drug, one indication. Um, but that explorative work is the wheelhouse of basic scientists like, like me. Um, but, but it's not easy. It's that kind of work it'd be hard to get NIH funding for. It's a kind of, it's a kind of freedom that philanthropy allows you. And, I'm not sure it's always clear to people why philanthropy is so important, but it does really grease the wheels of that basic explorative science. And they're legitimate questions, and you know, people take on that freedom anyway in, in the underground and so on, and ask those questions themselves and report benefits, and so then it's a matter of bringing that into you know, the disciplined world of controlled research to see whether there is, there is something there. It's a challenge. And also, it's hard enough to study one drug in isolation. I mean, the effect of one drug on the body is already unfathomably complicated and difficult to understand. And once you start adding additional variables to that equation, it can rapidly become a truly intractable problem to study. And I get a lot of emails from people say, you know, I just discovered something really amazing. I, uh, I found that if you combine ketamine with nitrous oxide, with MDMA, with LSD, with 2CB, it produces a truly transcendent state of consciousness that is uh, utterly extraordinary. I don't think, well, well yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, not, I'm sure it was great. But you know, it's kind of like saying I discovered a new dish that's like ice cream plus cookies plus uh, sprinkles plus a piece of fruit. It's like I don't doubt it's good, but uh, it, you know what is exactly being done here 
Um, there are a lot of combination experiments done in pharmacology, but it's usually with a very specific intention. For example, seeing if the co-administration of an antagonist at a certain receptor attenuates or augments a response. So there's a, for example, if you take LSD and you take the diethyl group and you wrap it into a morphine ring, it becomes a much less potent psychedelic, but at least in terms of rodent models. But that potency can be increased if you co-administer a 5-HD1A antagonist. So the 1A activity is attenuating the 2A response in rodents, right? So that, that's the sort of thing that you typically encounter, but it's usually done to probe very specific receptor interactions with selective ligands for various receptors as opposed to uh, combining a bunch of very good drugs into a cocktail that is even better, uh, which is fine, and, and, is, and, and will likely you know, in the future be something that is uh, more seriously probed, but I think at the moment that's, yeah, that's more for the, the uh, independent explorer. There is a funny irony there, which is in psychiatry, you know, um, uh, psychiatrists will um, prescribe a number of different drugs sometimes, so, um, you know, so they will load on an antipsychotic onto an antidepressant and so on. So that's another irony here is that, you know, in the, in the future maybe some of that polypharmacy will, will actually come from clinicians themselves, we shall see. Check. Check, check. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm excited, obviously. Um, I feel so blessed and happy and pleased to be here in such an amazing <coughs> excuse me, conversation. However, to the question of Robin, I think you mentioned that the most important aspect of psychedelic assisted therapy is talk therapy. Isn't that so? Like, I guess my question is, what is the secret combat of dosing sessions and talk therapy? Because that's something that maps are doing with the intentions and dosing, therapy, dosing session and then integration. Or is it something that can be assisted therapy in part of this? Yeah, well, it, when the term synergy came up, I, I was thinking the classic synergy is drug times the psychotherapy, psychotherapy broadly defined. Um, I do think that that's where this, the, you know, the sort of magic combo really, really lies. Um, that's my view, I think drug alone, while it might work in, in terms of some commercialization imperatives, um, you know, given that the therapy is expensive and complex and, and not without risk itself. But I think really, if you want to risk mitigate and sustain positive responses, I think the combination with psychotherapy is, is, is critically uh, important, is my own view. Um, we shall see whether that's right or wrong. But that's the model we adhere to. We recently did a, this will take us a little bit full circle, but we recently, uh, tapped into this idea of whether the drug itself, in people's eyes, in their perception, after the experience, um, did, did they believe that the agent itself had some intrinsic healing properties? There's this notion of the so-called inner healer that is uh, talked about often as part of the MAPS training protocol. Listen to the inner healer, give, you know, let go to the inner healer. It's alluding to some intrinsic, almost, you know, intelligence uh, to the process using the analogy of bodily healing after an injury, you know, self-healing, automatic healing. I think it's a fascinating construct as I'm learning that others find it similarly. Um, but uh, I just wonder whether, if that action is indeed real, if it, it's real mechanism and not just some kind of suggestive mythology, then even still twinning it with with psychotherapy, uh, in my view, would, would get the best uh, synergy out of that action. I, I tend to, brought up a whole new thing there, but I tend to think that it is a thing. It's not all myth, part myth maybe, or part exploited, um, but also mechanism. And, but the mechanism, psychotherapy has mechanisms, you know, three common factors of relationship, good relationship, whatever the 
psychotherapeutic model, the relationship being good, the rapport being good, the alliance being good. Then the expectations and the intentions, that's a common mechanism in psychotherapy. And then the and then commitment to change, the adherence aspect. So, you know, those are all causal mechanisms. They're not, you know, so obviously mechanistic in the biological sense, but they're still causal mechanisms. And I can just see them sort of working in tandem in synergy with with the, the drug action to yield the best outcomes. We shall see. Well, thanks everybody. Five minutes until the next presentation, so if you want to change rooms, please hurry.